Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Bible study. Um, We're continuing in the gospel according to St. Matthew. This week we are in chapter 4. And so we'll see what we find out here. We see here the calling of uh, Simon in this in Matthew's gospel versus what we had last week in John's gospel. So, but... Nope, we're exciting week. We're getting closer to our annual meetings. St. Olaf will have their annual meeting this Sunday and also Trinity Lutheran. And then next Sunday, English and uh, Do- our Saviors in Dovery will have their annual meeting. And next Sunday, I'm really excited, is we get to officially offer Pastor Stephanie a full call, or a, not a full-time call, but a full permanent call here, rather than the temporary one she's been working under. So I'm hoping we can get a lot of people at English to come out and Join the annual meeting, along with all the other churches. Um, I know at St. Olaf, it's fun to watch and see what the endowment committee is doing. And and so, but again, thank you for joining us. We are in Matthew chapter 4 for the third Sunday after Epiphany. Let us pray. Lord God, your loving kindness always goes before us and follows after us. Summon us into your light and direct our steps and ways of goodness that come through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. So our reading is Matthew 4, 12 through 23. Here Jesus begins his public ministry shortly after John the Baptist is imprisoned by Herod. He proclaims the nearness of God's reign and calls four fishermen to be his first disciples. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of our Lord. So, so after, John's, after Jesus hears of John's arrest, he withdraws, and withdraws to the Galilee area. This means leaving his hometown of Nazareth and making a new home in Capernaum. Yet he is often, not often home. Instead, Jesus devotes his time to preaching, teaching, and healing. He is on a mission. Only Matthew's gospel introduces this change of a hometown for Jesus to Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. This small detail is significant for those who understand the settlement of the 12 tribes of Israel and the promises associated with each. The prophet Isaiah is quoted as his words pertain to the geography, but also to the image of people sitting in darkness and seeing a great light. This image of Jesus as the light of the world is only in Matthew's gospel, but not, but not developed in Matthew's writings. It is in the gospel of John which develops that image. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it, from John 1, verse 5. Jesus claims the title as himself as he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, from John eight twelve. So when have you heard Jesus referred to as the light of the world? I can't just put a place on it, but I think most of the most of the writers indicate that he's he's who we have to look for. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking more of this too, is in the terms of um, Christmas Eve, when we do the, uh, lighting of the, the lighting of the candles and the reading from John's Gospel, where we hear, you know, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness mm-hmm. did not overcome it. And so, what are the implications when light breaks through darkness? 
You can see where you're going. Yeah, I was thinking about Monday with all the fog. Well, when the sun right. finally came out. Or even, you know, I remember all the you know summers I spent at camp and walking back and forth in the dark at, when you could see the camp light or the campfire. Being able to know where you were going and that you were finally reaching your destination. Or even coming home now and coming back from Mankato, I can see Meadowlands all lit up and mm -hmm. know I'm getting close to Walnut Grove. So how might light become a symbol of hope? Well, you follow it and by following it, we see where we're going. Yeah. Well, I think too is, you know, I remember growing up, I, you know, being afraid of the dark and so having a light, you know, to alleviate those fears, to show you that the darkness is not stronger than your, or your fears are not, you know, not coming to fruition. Okay. Well, Jesus picks up the preaching theme introduced by many of the Old Testament prophets, and especially John the Baptist. Jesus proclaims, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. To repent means literally change, one, change one's direction and face a new way. Jesus breaks into reality to introduce a new way of being. So what does the word repent mean to you? Change your ways. Yeah, change your ways. He's doing something wrong. Stop, yeah, stop. I was thinking, stop doing what you're doing wrong. <laughs> you know, I always remember the uh, comic I see, see every so often is two pastors are out on the road and one's got a sign, the end is near. The other one says, turn around. <laughs> and the car just drives straight by, not worrying about it. And then they look at each other and they said, you think we probably should put bridge out instead? <laughs> you know, sometimes we need to turn around. So why might Jesus focus on repentance? Well, he was sent to make a, make a change in, in the way things had been going. Mm -hmm. And... I think that, you know, we we're talking earlier about the problem of greed. I mean, it's where we naturally want to go is, and repentance is changing. So rather than seeking for ourselves, we seek for others. And I think that's part of what Jesus is trying to do is to keep us from just staying on ourselves and being able to see, see others, to be able to see God, not just ourselves. Okay. Well, ministry is not intended to be a solo enterprise. One of the first things Jesus does is call disciples to follow him. The scene of Jesus calling the fishermen is a familiar one, but Matthew keeps his story at its bare minimal. There is no description of a bad fishing night, advice from Jesus about casting nets on the other side of the or overflowing nets. Jesus simply calls the disciples, and they immediately follow, excuse me, follow him. They were obedient to the call, leaving their boats and torn nets. Brothers James and John even leave their father to mend the nets. So what questions do you have about this passage? I always felt it was kind of cool that Jesus would pick up two brothers and, you know, and feel like they were his brothers. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't say if they had a connection before, but I kind of mm -hmm. wonder if they maybe didn't. But yeah. then again, he was Nazar. I don't know for sure how far the Capernaum area was where he was in the Sea of Galilee and Nazareth, but you know, just always picture that as being kind of. Yeah, I have to admit, I assume he's probably been in Capernaum for a little while at this point mm -hmm. when he calls the brothers. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. But yeah, I just imagine the immediacy of it. I mean, how often does somebody call and you immediately drop everything mm -hmm. and go and do something? You know, you will, you know, somebody's having health problems or, you know, you'll drop everything, but, or the house is on fire. Um, you know, but usually we aren't immediate. It's, oh, as soon as I get my coat, as soon as I get my wallet, as soon as, you know, as soon as the car's warmed up, it's, you know. That's why I think maybe they knew him. Yeah. Or had been familiar with him. That they yeah. would just take That's off. Some of the assumption. 
Well, I can't imagine leaving your dad. You know. You felt that that was that important? It's no fun when I have my girls promise to help me with their project and then they find something more fun to do. <laughs> well, it's happened to be four, too. Yeah. So, what questions might the fisherman had for Jesus? For how long? <laughs> <laughs> how long? Where? Well, all um, the things. Yeah. What are we doing? That, and I don't know if you've ever gone around throwing nets over people. Most people don't appreciate it. So I have to imagine they're wondering what that meant to be fishers of people. A different image. So at what point do people of faith leave their questions aside and follow, trusting in God to provide the answers? A lot of soul searching. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to do to discern what choice is for the best yeah. or the better of the two evils as, as sometimes it happens, you know. Um, yep, I know that's one thing I hear about pastors is many of them ran away as far as they could before becoming pastors, you know, trying to to fight that and fight that and it's, yeah and it's and it's i think it's not that much different you know we with lay people you hear you know i'm not familiar enough with the bible or i don't know what to say and and there's a lot of worry about what happens once you take that leap of faith sometimes i think your best leaders can be the ones that you connect with the best mm -hmm. not maybe, maybe the best scholarly or, or whatever but ones that aren't afraid to dig in deeper and and sort out right and wrong and yeah. and uh, best course of action um, yeah not like the ones hate who... to say what would Jesus do but kind of what is the what is what is called to do yeah well what would Jesus have us do you know what does it mean to truly put God and neighbor before ourselves yeah. And like you said, sometimes you really fight it, but you end up doing it anyway. Yep. And I think, you know, but once you make that leap, I think, you know, like anything I think with faith is once you realize you aren't dead the first day, you know, the second day gets easier and the third and the fourth. And it's not always easier, but it usually more easier days and hard days, to, at least to keep the faith. There are still hard days, even when you make that leap. Mm. Yes, it's kind of eight already. Yeah. But yeah, it's hard to leave, leave everything. I you still can't imagine that. But people do it. Yeah. And, you know, um, they share some very insightful stories along the way. Yeah, I know. I Even though they never do, they, they, I know, I think of Curtis. I mean, it's just an endless yeah. issue for... It's hit, a generational. The, the, it, yeah. it just, every, every time he thinks, you know, that he's making a headway, they just fall back into a pattern of, yeah. of alcohol and... Just, well, it's a strong addiction, and yeah. and you know, as Europeans, we've had the fortune. It is in our genetics, we've been drinking alcohol for thousands of years, so our bodies were used to take it. Take it or leave it. Yeah, but yeah, it's a hard, hard addiction to get over. You know, I think about yeah, you know, one of my ministry friends, missionary friends. You know, realizing that when the kids were young, they left the kids behind. You know, they left everything behind to go out someplace where they had constant razor wire surrounding the house so they could make it through the night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that would be a jump like I'd be that. able to make. Yeah. Yeah. I feel pretty safe to leave my doors unlocked and, you know, I. <laughs> 
I don't know what they want, but I'll help them if they come and break in. Yeah, I spent too much time in the Twin Cities. Probably, but there's people in the Twin Cities that leave their doors open because they don't feel don't feel the necessity. But yeah, things can change in the drop of a hat. That it can. Okay, well, throughout the first chapters of Matthew, there is a theme of obedience. People generally desire to please God, live in a right relationship with Him, and respond with radical obedience. There is light in Jesus, which invites these followers to change their lives to follow Him. Okay, now to the word among us. The storm knocked out all the electricity. This was not the first time for this to happen, but each time it was unsettling. Slowly, the family moved through the familiar dark house and found a flashlight. Click. Light shone in the room and overflowed down the hallway. They looked at each other with some relief. It was going to be all right. There was light. Next, they found candles and matches. They placed their candles in strategic places to cast out all darkness. Then they relaxed and waited for the repair trucks. They could not work on their computers, watch television, or do much of anything. And so they talked with each other and shared stories. They stayed up late, laughing and being silly. On that night, light cast out all darkness. So recall a time when you were in a dark place. I think we've all been um, out in the woods or something. I, I know bear hunting, it gets yeah. just completely black when the sun goes down. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, you just can't see it all without a light. And sitting there, it's, it's kind of eerie. That's one of the differences of going into a place that has more trees than we do down here. When the sun goes down, it it's goes there down. For a little while. But it's not as long, I think, here. And then, you know, I think about my wife and I and some friends went to the Black Hills one year and we went down into one of their caves. Mm. And the guide at one point told us to stop, hold on to something, he turned off the lights. And it was just complete black and nothingness. Mm -hmm. and it was so nice to have the lights turned back on. Mm -hmm. and so and it's, then, you'd think that your eyes would adjust after a while, but sometimes it's just so black that yeah. it, it just, there is no... There's not much. No. Yeah, even Especially outside. if it's a cloudy night. Yeah, I was just going to say that. That's the hard part. You know, how was light brought into that place? Well, there they had electricity or I know when the power goes out, it's nice to find the flashlights. And mm -hmm. My girls give me a hard time because I like flashlights. So I always have light available. Nowadays, I worry about the heat. Okay. Well, Jesus is the light of the world. He is the one to cast out darkness. In his ministry, he casts out darkness as he preached, taught, and healed. His light was not kept for a few, such as the Jews. The light of Jesus would not be restrained or contained, but overflowed to the Gentiles and the world. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the light of the world? My, my, my mind goes to this little light of mine, you know, um, and, and his, his light that, you know, the, his star that the wise men followed. I mean, just so many... And I think at first your question about being the light and there are so many places that we see that mm -hmm. um, symbolism. Yeah. yeah. I think, and also the light is, I mean, that's the hard part is you look out in the world, you turn on the news, what are you gonna see? It's, it's all darkness. You talk to people, you know, people, you know, we were grieving yesterday for Nancy. We were, you know, we've got several people who have cancer and heart problems and other problems. I mean, there's troubles in the world. And I think for the light to the world is, you know, is Jesus giving us hope, giving us a knowledge that this is not what controls us. You know, I think of um, Mr. Rogers, you know, they have that, um, quote of his going around when things go wrong look for the helpers you know look the light is still there even in the midst of horrible things and so 
And how have you experienced Jesus as the light of the world? I guess his presence is knowing that, that he's, he's there. And, and you, you know, you mentioned the people that have, have these health issues. They're sometimes going to see them, their attitude is just so positive. And you know it's because they've got a strong belief that there's something better. They're going to either fight this or not, but they're going to try. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Well, I think that's, it, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say what, you're, what you just said. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the feeling that, you know, in that darkness, you're still not, you're not consumed you're not by it and you're yeah. not alone yeah but but to be you know that that's what i've seen um when i brought my comfort race i call it but you know um positiveness mm -hmm. even when they've got a lot to overcome yeah okay. well some people do not want light to be cast upon them because they are comfortable in their own ways Others are so lost that they are aching and searching for someone to show them the way. They are tired of stumbling and falling in the darkness. So where do you find yourself today, in light or in darkness? It was pretty dark coming over. It was so foggy, and then all of a sudden, oh, it left up for a little while. Um, but I think I try to always be more of the light. Not always, though. I've had some really down stuff in the last yeah. months or two, but but mostly try to not let the bad stuff put you in darkness. Keep focusing on the good. Yeah, a little bit of both. It's you know I can see the darkness and it's troubling, but having faith. That's the and knowing what you can change and what you can't. Yeah, that's it, the hard part, is it, knowing there's it, nothing that, yeah. not much you can do for the greater darkness, except for the, what's around you. Sort of like a candlelight, it's not going to illuminate all of Walnut Grove, but it will illuminate what's around you. So, can you relate to sitting in darkness? Explain. Yeah. Well, it gets, it gets pretty comfortable. I mean, you know what it's like. For some, if they like to stay there, and for others, it's it's a dreadful night of wondering what's going to come in the morning, depending on where you are in life. Because I know that, yeah, I think about, you know, the people who are comfortable where they are. I remember the story uh, we talk about at um, tech study with um, C.S. Lewis, saying he'd met some boys in London playing on the street, making mud pies, and invited them to come to the ocean and see the beach with him and play on the beach. And they looked at him and said, we can't imagine anything greater than this. We're going to stay here. You know, that's where they're comfortable. That's where they found their peace. And that's, so rather than looking for something greater. And I think sometimes we get stuck in that. And others, it is sitting on the side of the bed or and the long drive to Sioux Falls, wondering what's going to be there when you get there. And not knowing. There are many ways darkness comes into our lives. Okay. Well, this passage also includes the description of Jesus calling his first disciples. First, he calls the brothers Peter and Andrew, followed by the brothers of James and John. All of them respond to Jesus by immediately leaving their nets to follow him. Note the word immediate is used in Matthew 4.20 and 4.22 to describe the response to Jesus. Their radical obedience to Jesus' invitation is striking. So what kind of person leaves their livelihood to follow a teacher? Well, they must have felt similar calling, mm -hmm. I guess, that always thought that they they felt and and we know that they had been teaching Jewish law yeah. and 
in the scripture too. Um, but their family job was fishing. Yep. So. And that's pretty prestigious too for a uh, a fisherman to be welcome to follow a rabbi, a teacher, to become a disciple or student of. But any type of person is either, you know, trying to think of all the different possibilities. One is somebody who wants something different. You know, maybe you really hate fish, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's time to move. I mean, we've seen that with our economy nowadays. You get into a job that just doesn't work for you and anything that comes up that looks better, you immediately are willing to follow. And others are those who are seeking something that are better. And we know that we have so many children who start something right out of high school that they it's just not right. So they change oh, yeah. their major or they quit school, get a job, um, go in the service, you know, do nothing for a while. I mean, you know, there's a lots of yeah. um, changes when you're growing up that yeah. you think you want, but then... When you get that, it isn't what you want. And yeah. then how do I get something better? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the other hard part is, you know, one of the things we ha have as Lutherans is the idea of our calling, what we're called to be in life. And I think sometimes that's hard to discern, especially early on, is there's so many things grabbing for our attention that something may look really cool and interesting and you get there and you find out it's not who you are, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, realizing it's acceptable to realize it's not who you are and accept that other, look for other calls. Cause yeah, I know I, yeah, I can't imagine being a nurse and helping people out and stuff like that. That is yeah. not mine. You know, I, I, my, my confirmation, I felt that I wanted to be able to be part of my church for as long as I possibly could. I didn't think it was going to be 70 years, but it has been. And I'm so mm -hmm. thankful that God called me to do that. But also circumstances called me to be a nurse too. We had this tornado where everything was devastated. People we knew this, this little girl decided that, well, not so little, but 15 year old me, yeah. um, that this was something that I felt God could always, mm -hmm. always use my skill to do. And that's yeah. never look back. And so we all have different callings and it's, you know, really blessed when you could find that one right away. I didn't think it would be here, but it, it turned out to be. Yeah, I know that was one thing on the news is Talking about rural communities, I guess there's a doctor in Duluth who was a professor there, and his calling was to prepare doctors to be rural doctors. You know, specifically look, specifically to be in the smaller communities. And, well, Kelly and Hoffman at one time said too that that being able to to give the best care you possibly can to your family, your neighbors, um, mm -hmm. is is what she was called to do too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, you know, I, I'm sure that's, if you talk to Andy, Kelly, Andy and I were only, we were only raised about three or four miles apart. Mm -hmm. You know, our little Ann Township area raised an awful lot of good people. Oh, yeah. You know, I think too is, you know, and then the other thing is sometimes you see a spark of something that draws you to that. And so to be able to follow, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you may not know what it is for sure, but you feel a compul com compulsion to go in that direction. And so it makes it easier to be more immediate. And so, okay. Well, do you think Jesus would get the same response from people today? Yeah, he probably would. Because of the way he was, I, I think they probably would. They probably would see that need to follow this leader, this teacher, because we all know what a great, great teacher he was from his readings of the disciples.
Yep. And they would have, yeah, if they had met him beforehand, they would have seen the charisma he had when he spoke. Absolutely. And I think today, I mean, you see the number of people we have that step up and help with Sunday school, that step up and help with church council, that step up and help their neighbors in a multitude of other ways. And I think it's, that would still happen today as people would be willing to follow or would be willing to give up everything to, if Jesus knocked on the door and said, follow me. I have to admit, that's the difference now is it's much more gradual. Not well, much more responsibilities too yeah. that that we have placed on ourselves that we would have to try to find someone else to take on. Yeah. Yeah. So who in your life models the life of an obedient servant of God? Well, probably like Mother Teresa or um, Dr. King. Yeah. Uh, I, I think of how he's he gave up so much. I, I know so many, but maybe that was the way he could be recognized more so because he, we lost him. I have to admit, that's a hard thing to realize that if you speak out, Somebody's you could die. Gonna, somebody's going to kill you. And that's, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine what to do and knowing that, you know, that could happen. But I think, too, is, you know, if you look at, you know, larger society, I think, you know, another one is Jimmy Carter, you know, how oh. he's still teaching Sunday school and... But I think even locally, you know, we need more people in political limelight like him. But there just aren't that many because they get to be so corrupt for whatever mm -hmm. reason. They can't they can't operate unless they have an agenda. I feel there's a few. That's the hard part. Is it's it requires an ambition to want to get that far, and that yeah, that's, that's probably right. Versus seeing it as a calling. It's more of an ambition than a... You're probably right there. There, there are some who are called. I mean, that's the thing you look at the... Uh, Rebecca felt she was called. Oh, she, she told me that when, before she... Yeah. And she says, I, I want to make the rules. I want to mm -hmm. try to do the right thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I think about... And the next thing I know, she was in politics. Yeah, and then you think about even the civil servants, the government employees. I mean, most of them mm -hmm. want to do what's right as much as they can. But I think, too, locally, you know, I think of, you know, your mom and Marv, who were mm -hmm. always out there, patient and kind and, and doing that. Debating if I want to be mean or not. With Nancy Oslin would have been one yeah. too. Yeah. She she played this organ in these churches forever. We so appreciated her skill and um, she was a youth leader in our church. Um, yeah. Good people. Yeah. Good person. No, I was tempted to call out Sadie because she likes she's willing to be my sermon illustrations. You mean father. Okay. So, that she doesn't run away when I do it. Okay. So, what might you learn from that person? Well, I guess most of those people you named, just, they just do what they feel they need to do and, and uh, share their skills, their talents. I think another thing is it's who they were. Well, that's I mean, it true, became true. their, you know, their life. I mean, it was all encompassing. Which means practice makes perfect. <laughs> Which is hard sometimes. Okay, how do you show your obedience to God? Hmm. Probably not very well. Well, I think, you know, the ways we show our obedience, you know, to be patient, to be kind. Sometimes it's hard to do that. It is, you know, but, you know, being caring with the kids. 
Yeah, you know, as much fun as it is to go to the youth gatherings and things like that, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of stress. You're expected to bring all of them home in one piece and alive. And not kill them. Yes, and yeah, not do it yourself, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, but it is to show that love to them. And, you know, I think the other thing too is, you know, is to be able to share the story, you know, and. You know, I know that's one thing, yeah, that's always a little bit different talking from a pastoral experience is, you know, part of that obedience was, you know, being able to go wherever a church called you, mm. you know, whether it was in South Dakota, North Dakota, and finally here in Walnut Grove, <coughs> and being mm. willing to go wherever, wherever you feel called. <clears throat> and fortunately, Walnut Grove is an awesome place. So it's not that hard. <laughs> But, but it's still, you know, changing locations and well, it's similar with nursing. You had to move away to do your schooling. and I, I had so many talks with God at the farm. How, how or where, where's my life going? Look up into the sky and this little 15-year-old, where is it going to end up? And you just follow that, you, yeah. you know. Apply to school and and uh, and right away as soon as I was done with school, these people that were moving to Farwell that I told you about that fought oh, with yeah. the electrical lines, I I took filled in her place and and okay. had um, had to uh, um, work in the nursing home in Westbrook, and I wasn't qualified. She was an RN. But they got a variance because they couldn't get anybody else. Yeah. So I was a person and I had a license and I, I had a lot of help by uh, very seasoned LPNs that could have oh, easily yeah. been an RN. And it went fine. Yeah. But I learned a lot more patience with older people yeah. than and, and people with dementia and... I learned a lot. Yeah, that's so, it's a pretty quick learning. Made curve. me a good nurse. Oh, good. So. so, okay. So, well, thank you for joining us. Let's end with a word of prayer. Um, light of the world, shed your light upon us. Show us your ways and keep us on the right path. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Dig deeper. You can go in Isaiah one through four. Um, last wor word is light a candle. Pray for God to enlighten you in all decisions in the coming week. And speaking of decisions in the coming week, St. Olaf and, our, and um, Trinity Lutheran will be having their annual meetings this week. So come join us for those decisions. And next week will be English and Our Saviors in Dovery. Um, and got to look at the date here. Okay, so English will be at 8.30 along with Our Saviors. And then Trinity and... St. Olaf will be at 10.30 this day, this week. And if I remember right, I think the uh, kids are singing at St. Olaf this mm -hmm. week. I think I remember right. I don't have anything to do with that. And so it's the last late Sunday of the month. So sure. it should be right. And so come to St. Olaf and see what's happening. Um, anything else there? No, I think that's mostly it for this week. So, but thank you for joining us and God be with you.